What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with the really the finale of the century by Paul Jenkins and Jay Lee. And this is of course where the grand poobah fight happens with the century and like everybody else, right? One of the coolest moments in the entirety of Marvel Comics. So the first thing to understand here is coming out of the last video that we did, which you'll find a link to it down in the description, that we ended up having this revelation that Robert Reynolds, where we thought he was a schizophrenic, struggling with mental illness and coping with alcoholism, that he is actually a superhero. And for whatever reason, nobody remembers that he exists. Nobody remembers that he even the century at all. And so in an effort to understand why this is going on, what Robert Reynolds is doing over the course of this video, going into its conclusion, is that he's literally traveling around, visiting some of the most prominent superheroes that he was actually friends with and trying to understand why nobody recalls his existence. The first person he visits is Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. Now there's a few reasons why this is the case. The first is because according to Robert Reynolds, as he's talking to Reed, both he and Reed were best friends at one point in time. And two, because the Fantastic Four are kind of like the, the grandfather, right? Just the original superheroes in Marvel Comics, right? The most respected superhero team out there. And so it makes sense that he would go to Reed first. But the first question that Reed has when Robert Reynolds arrives on the scene is, how in the world did you get in here, right? I mean, the Baxter Building or Four Freedoms Plaza, right? In years gone by in Marvel Comics, but the base of operations in general for the Fantastic Four has a kind of force field around it. It's why like the average tourist in the city of New York can't just walk into the Baxter Building and start taking pictures, right? Because there's a force field that they can't get through. And this is supposed to be impenetrable to everybody except for the Fantastic Four, who basically have a kind of access code of sorts that allows them in and out. But the fact that Robert Reynolds could get in here baffles Reed, because as far as Reed's concerned, he's never met this guy once in his life. And even Robert Reynolds has all the dressings of a person who's struggling with mental illness. He talks about being a superhero, he has like his costume, but in reality, it's a leather jacket with a cape that's tied on with clothespins. I mean, the guy looks like he's struggling with mental illness, but through it all, he's resolutely convinced that he knows who Reed Richards is. And so when Reed starts asking, like, why should I remember you? Like, I don't know anything about you, man. The response of Robert Reynolds is, yes, I don't know how to make you understand. Somehow, everybody's been conditioned to forget I ever existed. You're supposed to think I'm just some drunk who took a wrong turn. I don't know what's happened. I think there may have been some kind of conspiracy. You see the mental illness that could potentially be perpetuated here, right? And so what he says, the only real thing he says here is he says, I want you to try and remember one thing for me, Reed. You went to a wedding once. I want you to remember a wedding. And the response of Reed is, why? And that's when Robert Reynolds says, because something's going to happen, something monumental. And when it does, I'm going to need your help. And so where Reed initially kind of dismisses him, Robert Reynolds kind of sniffs a rose and then just says, unicorn. And that seems to be this triggering word because while Reed Richards up to this point has just kind of been like, like, all right, man, you need to leave. Suddenly it jogs a kind of sensation within Reed where he says like, I don't remember that. I'm not allowed to remember that. And that's when Robert Reynolds leaves. And so what ends up happening is Reed basically goes back into the Baxter building. He meets with Susan Storm and then says like, did we ever go to a, to a wedding once, right? Where there was like a unicorn or something like that. And lo and behold, as they're having this conversation, seemingly this golden unicorn that's literally sitting on the wall seems to basically just appear. Now, the reality here is it's always been there. It's just for whatever reason, Reed Richards and none of the other members of the Fantastic Four were allowed to remember either the unicorn or the events that led to him being given the unicorn. So in reality, they just walked by it all the time with no concept that it was even there. And so in response to this, Reed asked the question, where did that come from? And so that's when Susan says, Reed, I can't explain why, but I get the strangest feeling from this, the oddest sense of deja vu. And that's when Reed says, I know, me too. It's the most curious thing, but I'll swear all of this has happened once before. So it's just this really, really amazing moment where it's like Robert Reynolds is telling the truth. And Reed Richards, the Fantastic Four, they're all kind of coming to this realization that this guy is not lying. But ultimately, this, you know, golden unicorn is sitting on top of a tape. And so when Reed Richards takes the tape and then puts it into the VCR, that once he hits play, the entirety of the Fantastic Four are in a state of shock. Because on this VCR tape is Reed Richards himself telling him, you may never ever see the contents of this tape. And if you don't, the universe is better off for it. But if for some terrible reason, you are watching this tape, then it means a man named Robert Reynolds has come to visit you and he's told you that he's the sentry and is sending you on this path to understand what's going on. But if Robert Reynolds is now back, that means the void is returning as well. That's his premonition. And if the void is truly here, then we are all as good as dead. And so following that, it literally picks up with Robert Reynolds traveling to go see the Incredible Hulk. This is a really, really, really cool moment here because as you guys know, the nature of the Incredible 
Incredible Hulk mythos is the Hulk's just like a giant green rage monster who always wants to be left alone. And being able to attain not only the friendship, but the respect of the Hulk is a pretty monumental thing. Now, one of the other things that I want you to notice as well that's going on with uh, with, with the Sentry is that his costume is actually changing. It's one of the small little subtle things that takes place over the course of the comic, but his costume actually evolves over the course of the comic book and becomes really a true costume for himself. One of the things to know, and while it's not overly illustrated here in the comic, it's established later on in his appearances in Marvel, but the Sentry has the ability to alter reality. It's not on the grand scale that you have with like Franklin Richards or anybody like that, or at least we haven't really seen it on that level. The Void can do that, but, but Robert Reynolds himself, the Sentry, is just a guy who can kind of alter reality in like a localized space. It's more used as a plot device than anything else. But as soon as the Incredible Hulk realizes that Robert Reynolds is there, he immediately hugs him and recognizes him as Golden Man. So for reasons that Robert Reynolds himself isn't even fully aware of, the Incredible Hulk remembers who he is. And one of the funny things here is that, that Robert even kind of muses to himself in asking the question, do you remember me because you transformed back and forth between the Incredible Hulk and Bruce Banner? And then that begs the question, does Bruce Banner remember who I am when he's in his human form? More so than that, the Sentry, right, Robert Reynolds refers to the Incredible Hulk as Banner, something he absolutely despises. But the reality here is that because the relationship between the two is so close, the Incredible Hulk, I wouldn't argue, is overly receptive to it, but actually gives into the idea, this kind of recognition that Banner and Hulk are basically the same person. But more so than that, and what's really important here, is the Sentry says he's going to need the Hulk's help. And when the Hulk asks why, the response to the Sentry is, because the Void's coming back. And in a very rare display in Marvel Comics, the Incredible Hulk shows fear. He's terrified of the void, right? Absolutely afraid of this guy. And that really is just a testament to the power of the void. Literally, the response of the Hulk is the shadow man is coming back. Like, I don't want to have to deal with that. And so literally he says, like when the, when the sentry says, I need you to be brave Hulk. I need you to be braver than you've ever been. The response of the Hulk is always for golden man. Hulk will be bravest there is. And it's just this really, really touching and kind of emotional moment, right? Where it's like this really almost kind of scared childlike sensitive side of what we would otherwise normally see as just being this rage monster that storms throughout the world and can literally obliterate virtually anything in his path. But the other part of this, right, kind of jumping back to Reed, because what you guys will notice is a lot of this story kind of focuses on Reed Richards to a degree as he's going through and kind of figuring all these little pieces out and so on, that what he does is he literally kind of goes through his own journal and he says like, I'm now willing to admit the further I go, the more distant I feel, as if abstractly removed from the comfortable evidence of civilization around me. This is though I'm being drawn into a whirlpool, ever decreasing concentrated circles of intrigue. The facts rush by in front of me and I cannot reach out to grasp them. Every time I try, an undercurrent of truth tugs at my awareness and pulls me deeper. And so what he's saying here is that all this information is literally rushing by him, right? He's looking up these files on like Robert Reynolds. According to the files, he's deceased. He's dead. He doesn't exist anymore. And so the question is, if this dead man is standing in front of Reed and having a conversation with him, he's obviously not dead. So why do Reed Richards' own files show that he's dead? Why is there a video of Reed Richards telling him the end of the world is nigh because Robert Reynolds is back and the void is ultimately returning as well? It's this really, really cool conversation because he says, I have only one theory which seems inapplicable upon further scrutiny. If Robert Reynolds was placed in the Federal Witness Protection Program, he doesn't seem to remember it, and that doesn't follow the modus operandi of the program himself. Now again, this seems fairly far-fetched, and it is, and it's supposed to be, because what this shows is that a highly scientific, logical, and intelligent mind like Reed is grasping at straws for what's going on with this whole situation, throwing out these far-flung theories. Well, maybe he's in the witness protection program and that's why nobody remembers him because he's just trying to understand what's going on more so than that and he says there's something else that really tugs at me and bothers me that this is something that i haven't experienced since i was a little kid i basically am developing an irrational fear of the dark and so what it does is it jumps to robert reynolds when he goes to visit spider-man and this is a cool thing because he literally says do you ever get the feeling you're forgetting something peter right he knows that that peter parker's spider-man but peter parker not remembering robert reynolds plays the role in saying well i don't know who who this Peter guy is, but if I ever see him, you know, then I'll pass on this, this message that you have. But it's kind of funny because Robert Reynolds is recollecting on a life that he had when he knew that Peter Parker was Spider-Man and they knew each other and they teamed up and they went on adventures to a guy who doesn't know who he is, right? So for, for Peter, it's just kind of like Robert Reynolds coming off as crazy. I mean, Robert Reynolds is talking about this like SNL skit where it was like they were pretending to be the Sentry and Peter Parker on like a rooftop, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's one of the things to know is that Robert Reynolds was seemingly, at least when the 
world was aware that he was a superhero was the superhero. He was the guy. Now, of course, this story is written a few years before Adam, the legend of Blue Marvel. So again, you know, Adam Brashear hasn't really been introduced yet. We don't really know his origin story. And in fact, we don't even know he exists at this point in time in Marvel Comics. But the thing about it is that like in a lot of ways, Robert Reynolds was the guy that taught superheroes how to be superheroes. He was a hero before the Fantastic Four, before Spider-Man, before Doctor Strange, before any of those guys rose to prominence with their various powers and capabilities. And that in that time when they were nursing at the teat of what it meant to be a superhero, Robert Reynolds had long since been playing this role. So he was as much a mentor and a friend to the superhero community as anything else. And so that's where he literally says like, here's the thing, Peter, you got a picture of me on a rooftop and I won you a Pulitzer Prize because of that, a portrait of the century. And when Peter's just like, like when he pulls out the picture and shows it to Peter, all Peter sees is a blank piece of paper. Again, his mind's been altered to where he doesn't know who the century is. And so as the conversation continues on, unlike Reed Richards, where he's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to remember that because there's a key word that's given, Peter Parker doesn't get that. Instead, all that happens is that Robert Reynolds tells Peter as he swings away, he says, go check magazines, right? Clarion, Time, Life Magazine, and see why they're misnumbered. Because magazines do not miss their numbering. It's one of the most religiously important things about magazines. It always runs in sequence. But if you go and you look those magazines up, you'll find issues that are gone. And so ask yourself the question, where did they go to? Why don't they exist? And so what it does is it jump, uh, jumps back to Reed as he literally goes into like this basement, right? Like this old filing, these old filing cabinets that he has that he hasn't touched in years. And as he starts sorting through these things, he finds all these old news articles, right? All these old newspaper clippings about the century teaming up with the Avengers and all this kinds of stuff. And in the middle of this whole investigation, Doctor Strange appears out of nowhere and says, yes, the century does exist, but he's exceedingly cryptic because when uh, Reed Richards starts asking him questions like, okay, well, tell me what you know, what's going on here? The response of Dr. Strange is, I can't give you any answers. And the reason why is because if I tell you the truth, it'll lead to the ruin of all. Because the truth of this is that you're going to trace that truth to its genesis point, to where all of this started. And when that happens, the universe will end because of that. And so the response of Dr. Strange is, I'm not going to give you answers, but what I will do is I will give you a vision. And so in this vision that he shows Reed, what we get is a conversation between the two where Reed's just working on some kind of a device, right? And says like, I pray to God it works. We have, have precious little time to pull this off. And so right when they activate this thing, Reed Richards makes a request of Dr. Strange. And when Dr. Strange says, what is it that you want from me? The response of Reed is the sentry. If we ever remember him in the name of all humanity, promise me you'll do whatever you can to make us forget. And so ultimately Dr. Strange says like, I will not answer the question that you originally asked ask me, Reed, but I will propose to you another question. Can you take your own advice? You on the videotape, before I destroy the VCR, right, you on the videotape told yourself you have to stop following this path. Do not follow this to its, to its logical conclusion. If you do, everything will end. That's you telling yourself that, Reed. Can you take your own advice? And so following that, it switches over to the X-Men and it has like Robert Reynolds visiting Professor Xavier. Now, Professor Xavier is one of the most powerful telepaths in existence in Marvel comics. I mean, this guy's telepathy at different points in time has rivaled gods. And so when you have a situation like this, where whatever manipulation has been done, that's basically blocked all knowledge of the century's existence from Xavier's mind, it's got to be pretty potent. And so as this conversation unfolds, much like Reed Richards, that Xavier starts to remember kind of the existence of the century. He doesn't remember the details. He doesn't remember everything that happens, but he does kind of remember him to a degree. And that's when literally the century tells him, I'm going to need your help. The voice is coming back. And when that happens, like when he, when Xavier's told that, much like what we saw with the Incredible Hulk, Xavier's scared out of his wits. He's terrified. And so what we end up doing here is we actually end up jumping over to the superheroes of Europe. Now, they're not overly important here, right? I mean, we never see these guys again. But what they do is they contact their base of operations, specifically Gareth, and saying like, we need help, right? Like this force here is annihilating all of us, right? Like we're some of the most capable superheroes throughout Europe. It's crushing us, right? It's literally just steamrolling through us. We need backup. We need reinforcements, something. You have to send aid before it comes back. But ultimately the communication's cut. Now, of course, this was the void attacking. And that's one of the things that I want to solidify here, that while Paul Jingas and Jay Lee kind of play it fast and loose with the nature of the void in terms of just how powerful it is, the most amazing example of the void's power was in the Siege on Asgard one-shot What If comic, right? Where like you had the whole 
actual conflict in Asgard and so on and so forth. We don't have to go into the details of it, but in effect, in that story, the Void basically kills every superhero on Earth and then spreads out into the universe, presumably killing everything out there as well. It's an amazing display of just how powerful the Void is. I mean, it's on a whole different level. But following that, we jump over to Peter Parker. Of course, at the Daily Bugle, he's visited by his, uh, his superior, Robbie Robertson, who's like, why are you here so late? What are you doing here like this early in the morning? And Peter took the advice of Robert Reynolds and he's combing through all these magazines, right? Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Clarion Magazine. Clarion Magazine being the magazine cover that got Peter the Pulitzer Prize where he had the image of the century on the front. And what he tells you know, Robbie Robertson is like, these are misnumbered. There's issues missing here. There's magazines issues missing and no one knows where they are. They don't exist here in the building. They're not stored digitally. They don't exist anywhere. And that's when Robbie Robertson is like, there is no issue number 743, right? That's the one that had the century on the cover. He's like, there is no issue number 743. It doesn't exist. It's not allowed to. So it's very creepy and very weird in terms of like what's going on. But as Peter starts to look through these magazines, you do have issue number 743 of Clarion, but there's nothing on the cover. But his pursuit of this information leads to him remembering the century. And him remembering the century actually manifests in the form of the cover becoming clear. And then he sees the image that the century was showing him where he was posing for the cover of the magazine that won Peter the Pulitzer Prize. And he says, oh my God, Robbie, the century, I remember him. I remember everything. And so that's when the century goes to visit Tony Stark. Now, unlike everybody else, Tony Stark remembers exactly who Robert Reynolds is. He remembers Robert Reynolds down to a T. And it's one of those things where he does isn't necessarily an enemy of Robert, but he's not really a friend. And he's just kind of like, I mean, like it's, this is, you know, I haven't seen you in a long time. Where have you been, man? Like, what's been going on. And so one of the things that I want to point out is that it's interesting how this is done because Tony Stark does not remember elements of Robert Reynolds. He remembers the general idea of the century, but he doesn't really remember everything else. Now, one of the interesting things here about Iron Man is that he remembers Robert Reynolds as a person. He doesn't really seem to remember the century at all, or at least that aspect of him. Instead, like as he meets Robert and as Robert starts asking him, like, or really starts saying like, I remember Tony Stark. I remember everything. Why of all people, why did you turn against me? Why did the superheroes of Earth turn against me? Why did everybody literally just wipe my existence from the minds of everyone. Now, one of the things that I want to, re want to remind you guys of, Robert Reynolds is only piecing things together here. He doesn't have all the details. He doesn't have all the files. But the reality is that Tony Stark's response, much like everybody else, is I don't necessarily recall everything. But in terms of, of Robert Reynolds' own recollection of the events that he's talking about here, it's really Iron Man that kind of spills the beans to a degree and saying, like, I don't remember all the details, right? Like, for the, uh, the event that you're talking about here, Robert, of being betrayed by the superheroes, I don't remember all the details. Details. All I remember is that something really bad seemed to have happened and the superheroes were all called together and you were called to us and that I stood by you and said, no, this is Robert Reynolds. How could like this revelation possibly be true, right? This revelation of him, the things he's done, how could any of it be true? This guy saved our lives more times than you could possibly imagine. But the determination, right? The verdict of the superheroes on earth, the Avengers specifically is at the end of the day, he is a superhero. He's done some great things, but for the benefit of all existence, Robert Reynolds has to die. He has to go away. And so when this bit of a revelation comes out that Robert Reynolds really almost kind of befriends Tony Stark, he sort of calms down and then he tells him like, the Void's coming back. I'm going to need your help. And of course, Tony Stark recalls who the Void is and what the Void's capable of. And that's when the only thing he actually utters here is God save us all, right? Like, may God help us all. And so as the, the century continues on his journey, he ends up basically realizing what he's not supposed to remember, or at least another bit of a recollection comes to him in the form of being able to actually see the Sentry Watchtower. And so when he gets there, he discovers what's basically a kind of sentient, a sentient computer, which is called Clock. And so of course, with this being a sentient computer, the most logical thing to do is to ask it questions that can reveal information. Because for the most part, computers aren't really biased, but of course they store a ton of information. And so the first and logical question that Robert Reynolds asks is, do you know where I've been? But the response that Clock offers here is, I cannot give you an answer to that question. There's a virus that's been planted deep inside of me that prevents me from being able to give you an answer to that question. And I guess you could override me, but I've been told to tell you that you shouldn't. 
And so there's a kind of device that hovers out there really in front of clock. And the questions asked, like, is this some kind of like a cloaking mechanism or something like that? And the response of clock is no, the device you're looking at is a transmitter. I detect the emission of a subliminal message. It is carried on a most powerful signal capable of reaching across our planet and far outside its atmosphere. The device appears to be powered by your own serum. And so when the sentry asks, do you know why it's here? The response of clock is, I am forbidden to answer that question. So the reality here is that this device that Robert Reynolds is studying, this is the device that's sending a signal out into the world, making everybody forget of the century's existence. This is the reason why nobody remembers, because this device is being emitted with such a level of power that even high-level telepaths like uh, Charles Xavier are unable to overcome the influence of the signal itself. And so, of course, following this, Robert Reynolds says, then disable the transmitter. But that's when Clock says, I'm unable to comply. And when Robert asks, by who? He says, by your order, sir. He says, I must urge caution. I I am obliged to inform you that the virus will disable my operating systems, rendering me unsalvageable if you attempt to tamper with the transmitter. So it's one of these things where it's like, if you mess with this, you'll ultimately end up destroying me. And whatever purpose this transmitter serves will now be moot. And so he asks a follow-up question, do you remember the last time you saw me? And of course, Clock says yes. And then he says, who was present? And he says, you were, sir. And he says, can you access the last order given to you before the device was activated? And the response of Clock is, I am forbidden. I am forbidden to to do it. And then of course, Sentry asks, it doesn't matter, I don't need the order, I just need to know who gave you the order. And the response of Clock is, it was given by Reed Richards. So it's this really, really, really cool moment because given what little information he's been able to piece together, the perception of Robert Reynolds is that this device that emits a transmitter that blocks the world from remembering his existence was established there by Reed Richards. And that Reed Richards himself had told Clock, ensure that Robert Reynolds does not mess with this transmitter should he ever show up. By all standards of measurement, it appears that Reed Richards is an enemy of Robert Reynolds. But at the end of the day, for the century, it doesn't really matter. He ends up dismantling the device in the first place. And that's when he starts to realize it's a curious thing. This thing seems to have been put together in a hurry. There's no trip wires, there's no additional viruses, right? There's nothing going on. That even seemingly messing with the transmitter and the idea that it would destroy clock was a lie, right? It was designed to kind of keep him away. But as soon as the device is deactivated, the world immediately remembers who Robert Reynolds is. They immediately recall everything about him. People who had posters of the century all over their room remember now that the posters were there. Even like Billy Turner, who was actually the sidekick of the century, right? His name was Scout. He recalls that like he was the sidekick of the century. Reed Richards remembers everything going on with like the wedding and the whole nine yards. Everybody recalls his existence. But what's so interesting about all this and what's so intriguing about all this is nobody recalls why the device was created in the first place. Nobody seems to remember that. But the important thing here is that the Sentry sees Reed Richards as his enemy. More so than that, Billy Turner Scout actually ends up donning his costume, even with one arm missing and just these massive scars on his body, and then shows up to join the Sentry. Now, one of the things that's not necessarily directly covered here, but is a really interesting aspect of their history, is that Scout was actually brutally attacked by the Void. That's why he looks the way he does, that's why he's missing an arm, because he was attacked in such an extreme way. And so it's a really interesting thing, because when Robert Reynolds gets back to his house, of course, his dog watchdog remembers who he is and then lindy's there now remember in the last video that we did lindy left him because she didn't remember that robert reynolds was a century and as far as she was concerned he had succumbed to alcoholism again right he's drinking from like his special bottle he's babbling on about how he has powers all the signs of a guy who has schizophrenia and coping with alcoholism and she believed he had been you know managed to put the alcohol behind him he was seeing a therapist different things like that so believing her husband had kind of relapsed into his old ways she left but once she basically remembers everything she comes running back because it's one of those things where it's like I'm so sorry like I, I I I didn't know like I didn't know any of this stuff now of course Robert Reynolds is quick to forgive because the reality is that it isn't her fault <laughs> her mind had been tampered with and screwed with but in the midst of this conversation and this kind of reunion between himself and Lindy the void attacks and that's one of the craziest things is because the void immediately overpowers the century so right off the bat one of the first things that we're, that's really established here is the void is more powerful than the century is but then he even kind of taunts him right he says step closer golden boy decide if you truly value your female's life the darkness has yet to fall perhaps i'm not yet strong enough to snap her spine like a dry twig but can you afford to take that chance and so where the sentry seems to maybe kind of make a move or so he's attacked and incapacitated by the void who simply says just as i thought ever the same century a little hero child with a heart of wax i told you i'd come back robert as you always knew deep inside your soul i would return and 
And so when Robert Reynolds asks, like, what is it that you want? The response to the void is the same thing I always wanted, to eradicate everything, to destroy all life in this universe, to feed on everything this universe has to offer, and then leave and travel to the next one. And so ultimately, the void ends up taking off. But in that revelation, and with everybody remembering the century, the century himself responds and kind of like broadcasts nationally to the world and saying, all these weird freak accidents that you've been reading about, right? These storms in London or these, these things that have been going on, right? These major calamities that didn't really seem to have any scientific explanation that this is all the actions of the void. You know who I am and you know how powerful the void is. That if I've returned, the void's return, the void in turn will lay waste to all. And so what I am asking for is this. I am asking for all of you to stay as calm as possible. I'm asking for the superheroes to rally to my side. I know you're scared and I know you're terrified of how powerful the Void is, truth to tell, he could potentially eradicate all of us, but we have to stand together if there's any chance for us to succeed. So meet me at the Statue of Liberty and together all of us, superheroes and supervillains alike, will stand against the power of the Void. And so what's really awesome about this is that they respond. Initially, of course, the Incredible Hulk shows up right off the bat and there's even this uncertainty as to whether anybody else will appear, but they do. Spider-Man, Captain America, even Billy Turner Scout shows up, right? The Avengers, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, there's even even villains here like Dr. Octopus, and of course there's other villains outside of him as well, but Dr. Octopus says like, even those of us in the villain community understand the level of threat that's posed here by the existence of the Void. He will kill us all. He will destroy every single one of us. And so when Reed Richards shows up, there's a very tense moment between Robert Reynolds and Reed where based on the memories, the things that Robert Reynolds recalls, Reed basically turned against him, right? Reed, Reed like lied, like even during the funeral of Robert Reynolds when he had quote unquote died, that Reed had told the world that he was a traitor, that by all standards of measurement, Reed had betrayed the friendship of Robert Reynolds and then destroyed his memory in order for, you know, for whatever reason that made sense to Reed. Even Reynolds himself doesn't fully understand, but the reality is that the events that are unfolding here and the arrival of the Void are way more important than anything else. And so what ends up going on is, of course, as the Void basically makes his appearance here, that Robert Reynolds is the first one to step up and the first one to launch an attack. And it's like this amazing moment here because you have these heroes who do want to attack as best they can, but for the most part, they're scared, right? They're terrified out of their wits. People like Thor step up, Thor gets crushed, but then that's when like Doctor Strange appears to read. That quite literally Doctor Strange slows down time and then says, we need to have a conversation. You now know that you are the one who created the device that blocked the century's memories or the existence of the century from everybody in the world. And you're the one who spoke at his funeral talking of him being a traitor. But do you know why you did all of this? Do you know why any of this happened in the first place? And this is one of the best moments of the entirety of the story. That what ends up happening is the Fantastic Four arrive in New York and the entirety of the place is just crushed devastated, right? Like millions and millions of people have been killed here. And that Robert Reynolds himself is facing off against the Void. But that in this fight, the Fantastic Four came to a realization that the Void is not just some arbitrary enemy out there, that the Void is the Sentry. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. And that's the reason why all of this is happening. That the reality and, and the reason why the device was created in the first place, Robert Reynolds has partial memories. Reed is now remembering all of it. That with this revelation, that Robert Reynolds is the Void and the Void is Robert Reynolds. The Void is the physical manifestation of every fear and every anxiety and every dark desire that Robert Reynolds has, right? Everything that makes him, or at least the, the darker side of him, manifest in the form of the Void. And the Void, his power is limitless. There's nothing the Void can't do. And so, faced with this revelation, that's when the Sentry is called before the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, and they bring to his attention the fact that they now know. It was the dark secret of the Sentry. It's what he kept from everybody. He hid it from every single person. Nobody knew the truth. But now that the truth is out, their response is, in order for the world to be saved, in order for the world to be safe from the effects of the void, the century has to die. And ultimately, what ended up happening is that faced with the prospect of his own demise, the idea of the century just literally being killed by whatever manner and whatever means, that himself and, and Reed Richards just got drunk, right? They just spent the whole time drinking. And that's when it dawned on Reed. There's an alternative to this, right? If the void exists, exists because the century exists, then why not just make it so, the, so nobody remembers the century? If you yourself don't remember that you're the century, the century can't manifest. And if it can't manifest, the void can't manifest, right? Because the void draws its power partially from the century. And so this idea is kind of cooked up to create the device that would allow everybody to forget the century exists, right? To wipe their mind.
minds. But it wasn't enough to kind of wipe their minds of the century because ultimately people would come looking, right? Somebody somewhere might remember something. And then as that time progresses, they'll start to recollect this great superhero that the world has seemingly forgotten. And so in order to push the world in a direction to where they not only forget the century, but have no desire to go looking for him, the story was concocted that the century was actually a traitor, that the century was a villain, he was a bad guy, that everything you thought you knew about him was a lie, that he was not a superhero of the people. And this turned society against Robert Reynolds. And so that's why it was so easy for the world to forget. And so in the revelation of this and the recollection of this absolute truth, that's when Reed comes to the realization and even Robert Reynolds himself gaining all this truth, even in just like talking to Reed, comes to the realization, the only way for the void to be defeated is for the century to basically be forgotten again. It's the only way to make that work. The void's just too powerful. He can't be defeated by any of the superheroes on Earth. Now, of course, people may end up asking the question, why don't they just get the Infinity Gauntlet, different things like that? The reality here is asking that kind of question actually takes away from what makes this story so phenomenal. Because it's not a it's not a simple comic book story where it's like, well, let's just grab the Infinity Gauntlet or like a Cosmic Cube and we'll just will the century or the, the void out of existence and like the day's safe. It's too, you know, that's, that's a traditional comic book story. What made this so cool is that it removed all those things and it focused on the, the human elements of the characters. More so than that, as Reed Richards starts to spill these beans and really kind of bring this revelation to Robert Reynolds, that what he says is like, when we activated the device and when I made the video for myself telling me if you ever see this tape, the whole world is screwed, you were there, Robert Reynolds. You were there when it happened. You were part of all of this. You and I worked together to create this device, to install the virus. Even when I told Doctor Strange, if the time ever comes when I remember or anybody else remembers the century, you have to do everything you can to make us forget. You were standing like right over there and listening to what I was saying and you agreed with it all. And that's when the void comes to the realization that the century is remembering everything. And so the void goes on this extreme attack in order to not only destroy the century, but seemingly everybody else. But at the end of the day, you literally have the century and the Fantastic Four, Doctor Strange and so on, who race to the Century Watchtower as fast as they possibly can and then reactivate the device. And it's a very crushing moment because for a moment here, Robert Reynolds was able to entertain the idea that he might be able to come back, that he might be able to be a superhero again, that he can go back to the life that he had and could potentially defeat the Void. But the truth about this is that it can't be that way, that you can't have the Century without having the Void. And because the Void is this unstoppable force of nature, the only way to save the world from the Void is to wipe away existence of the century. Robert Reynolds has to destroy everything that makes him who he is, even his own identity, in order to save the world. And at the end of the day, they do it. They activate the device and everything shuts down. Everybody forgets that Robert Reynolds is the century yet again, that the void vanishes. He's gone, disappeared. And even like when Robert Reynolds is in the car with Lindy herself, they're surveying all this damage, right? Like they're literally just driving to go get some food somewhere. They're surveying all this damage in New York, which not even that long ago, like a couple days before, was because the void was there. And like the century was there and all that kind of stuff. And Robert Reynolds was there. But because of the device, nobody knows why all this happened. It's considered like a freak storm. That's basically it. It's incredibly well written and it's incredibly well done because you do get this kind of brief little moment here where you have Robert Reynolds and you have Lindy who go to a restaurant in order to get some food, right? They go to Burger Palace, which is where Billy Turner works. Scout, who's still missing an arm and still has all these scars. And Robert Reynolds kind of looks at him and to a degree almost feels this level of repulse. But even on a basic level, while we're not really told, it's almost like he kind of remembers who Billy Turner is, that he remembers who Scout is, and he remembers why all this is being done in the first place. And so unlike in the previous instance when he himself was made to forget, the truth about this is he seems to choose to forget. Now we're not explicitly told this, and this this is more of a theory than anything else, right? Like by all standards of measurement, he doesn't recall anything, but the fact that he just kind of smirks to himself when he sees Billy Turner after just kind of like envision, right? Like mm -mm, burger palace, big chili hot dogs, big chili dogs, big enough to satisfy even a hero's hunger. He remembers, right? He remembers this stuff. And so he kind of smiles to himself and then just orders a chili dog. And that's where the story ends. But this is one of the greatest comic book stories ever in the history of Marvel comics. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. Thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.